today we're going to talk about baptism. Um, this is a topic that you know, there's a lot to say about it. I'm going to try to keep this really brief. Um, so, Christian baptism, uh, the first reference to it in the New Testament is in Matthew 28. Um, and this is something that's worth pointing out. We, we hear about John the Baptist at the very beginning of the Gospels. And it might be easy to, to conflate what John was doing with the baptism that churches practice today, but they were two distinct things. Um, the Bible calls John's baptism a baptism of repentance. And we see in the book of Acts people that had been baptized by John subsequently being baptized into the church in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, undergoing what we would call Christian baptism. John's baptism was a baptism to prepare people for the coming Messiah. Um, people who were baptized by John were showing that they were turning to God and, and preparing themselves for the coming Messiah. Christian baptism is uh, the fulfillment of what John was pointing ahead to. So, um, Christian baptism is is, is distinct. Jesus sets the parameters for what Christian baptism is when he talks about um, in the Great Commission, you know, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So historically, um, that is the formula that is used for Christian baptism in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. All Christians that believe in the Trinity that God is one being who exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, practice Trinitarian baptism. Um, there are some groups who practice what's called Jesus' name only baptism, um, but the reason that they do that is because they don't believe in the Trinity. They believe in what's called modalism, which don't have a lot of time to get into all that, but modalism is a denial that God exists as three persons. And so they in my view, distort certain passages in the book of Acts um, and insist that uh, baptism be done only in the name of Jesus, not in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, Christians debate a lot about whether baptism should be done by sprinkling or immersion. Um, I don't really want to focus on that because I don't think that's the most important uh, point to focus on. Um, I think that it's clear if you look at church history that immersion has been the, uh, the form that has been you know, most universally accepted across the board, uh, the least controversial version. Nobody contests the validity of a baptism by immersion. Sprinkling is a more controversial form in the sense that not all Christians do believe that's the proper form. Um, so if you're looking to pinpoint the, 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 the the form of baptism that passes the mere Christianity test, you know, this, this is a form that all Christians can agree on. Immersion is definitely that form. Um, I don't think it's wise to make the, the mode of baptism a dividing issue because I just don't think it, the, the Bible is, is that abundantly clear about the mode. Um, it is true that the word baptizo in Greek typically means to immerse, but uh, there are a few places in the New Testament where the word appears to be used a little bit more broadly than that. Um, another point of dispute is whether only believers should be baptized or whether infants should be baptized. Um, the case for infant baptism, which has been the majority practice of Christians throughout church history around the world, um, is the linkage of baptism with the ancient uh, Israeli ceremony of circumcision. When God called Abraham to himself, he gave Abraham the covenant of circumcision. And the rule was that all Jewish boys at eight days old were to undergo the, the ceremony of circumcision. Uh, and that, this was the sign of the covenant. This showed that they belonged to the covenant people of God. And it distinguished them from the other nations. Now, obviously, eight-day-old boys didn't have the capacity typically to grasp uh, what was being done to them, they would be given the sign of the covenant and then later grow up and learn about the covenant and embrace that covenant for themselves. But the being given the sign came first and being instructed in the covenant came second. 
children were included in the covenant. Those who practice infant baptism, one of the arguments in favor of it is that baptism essentially serves the same function today. Uh, they're not exactly the same function, essentially the same function that circumcision served in the Old Testament. And just like children were included in the covenant sign in the Old Testament, they ought to be included in the New Testament covenant sign. Um, given the fact that uh, circumcision was so common you know, in ancient Israel, if with the dawn of the, the Christian church in the book of Acts, the children were now moving forward going to be excluded from being given the sign of the covenant, that would be such a tremendous departure from custom that we would expect some kind of text explaining that children were no longer to be given the sign of the covenant. And in the absence of any kind of statement, it's, it's fair to, to conclude that children are continued, are going to be continued to be included in the covenant. So from that way of thinking, we don't really need a, a passage that says children need to be baptized. We would actually need a passage saying they shouldn't be. And in the absence of that, we should conclude they should be. I, I personally think that's a pretty strong argument. Um, that said, I, I don't think that Christians who disagree about this should, should you know, make this a, a point of division because those who practice what's known as believer's baptism do so on the basis that that's what you see in the book of Acts. And there's an effort to just follow that model in the book of Acts. And so, I, you know, I don't think we need to be uh, wrangling with our fellow Christians who are endeavoring to, to follow what they believe is laid out in Scripture. To me, the most important thing to really uh, discuss, more so than the mode, more so than even the age, is what baptism is and what it does. Um, the majority view among American Protestants today, and probably Protestants around the world, is to have a uh, very symbolical view of baptism, that baptism symbolizes a person's commitment to Christ, or it symbolizes their belonging to Christ. And I think there's certainly a sense in which it is it does do that, it does symbolize that. But I think the New Testament's language about baptism indicates that it's more than just a symbol. It's a means of grace. And by that, um, baptism actually confers upon a person the grace of God. Um, now, in saying that, I, I think it's important to point out that, that that God uses certain means to dispense His grace, but God is not limited by those means, to those means. God can dispense grace however, whenever He, he pleases. So to call baptism a means of grace is not the same thing as saying that a person who, who um, dies unbaptized has, has missed out on any chance of experiencing the grace of God. Um, you know, church history is full of deathbed conversions where people uh, you know, repent of their sins and trust in Christ and die before they have any opportunity to, to undergo baptism. And that shouldn't be a, so a source of alarm or a source of anxiety um, because the grace of God is not so tied to baptism where a person can't experience it otherwise. If a person calls on Christ for forgiveness, they obviously are, are being moved very powerfully by the grace of God and experiencing the grace of God. Um, but baptism is a means of grace, meaning that it's a, it gives us an objective basis for believing that God has claimed us for himself. Uh, within the evangelical world, there's so much subjectivity about assurance of salvation. How do you know you're, you really belong to Christ? How do you know that when you prayed the sinner's prayer, you really meant it? And those kind of questions can really torment people. And what I appreciate about uh, believing that baptism is, is God's work for us, not our symbolic work for God, that, that, that God actually claims us for himself and, and takes us to himself in baptism, is that it, it, it makes our assurance rooted in something objective. In baptism, the name of the, of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit have spoken over us. And we can point to that and say, God claimed me as his own. And because I've been claimed as his own, I don't have to worry about whether I meant it or whether you know, what's going on inside of me. I don't have to make that the focus. The focus is on what God has done for me. Um, Paul in 1 Corinthians, I'm sorry, not 1 Galatians, takes for granted that those who've been baptized have the Spirit of Christ. So today there's a tendency to speak of, of, of baptism in the Holy Spirit as if it's a distinct thing from water baptism. 
but you don't really see the distinction in the epistles. In Galatians 3, Paul says, As many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Um, so there's not really a category in the New Testament for a person who's been baptized who doesn't have the Holy Spirit. That This is the quote-unquote ordinary means by which a person is given the Holy Spirit uh, in baptism. And again, that gives us an objective basis for believing the Holy Spirit has been given to you because you've experienced God claiming you for himself in baptism. And it's important when we talk about baptism, it's not something that a person does to merit God's favor or a work. Understood that way, it's very wrong. But this is God's, God's work on our behalf. Um, 1 Peter uh, uses the phrase, baptism now saves you. Um, in the book of Acts, you know, you, you see the phrase, you be baptized and wash away your sins. And the book of Titus calls baptism a washing of regeneration. So there's there's a lot of language in the New Testament that, that points to baptism being more than just a symbol, but an actual uh, encounter with God and the grace of God. And, uh, and I, th I think that's the correct view. Um, I think it's an important thing to hold on to. So that's a quick look at um, Christian baptism. <laughs> There are other questions uh, that um, often arise, like who should be the person to administer baptism? Should it be an ordained minister, or can any Christian baptize? Um, things like that. I, I don't feel like those things are, are, are things that Christians need to wrangle about. Obviously, ordinarily, baptism is performed in the context of the local church. Um, but that's not to say that it, there aren't circumstances where other people might be called upon for baptism. Anyway, um, thank you for listening, and I uh, uh, appreciate you uh, giving me a few minutes of your time. Thank you.